Wasabi Wallet. I'm fairly private. What's up, everyone? Ben with the BTC Sessions here, and this is your daily session. Huddle that Bitcoin. Before we dive in, of course, I want to give a quick shout out to sponsors of the show, Ledin.io. This is where you can use your Bitcoin for a few different services, one of which is a Bitcoin savings account. So you can earn Bitcoin on your Bitcoin paid in Bitcoin. You can check out their Bitcoin backed loans. That's where if you need to get your hands on dollars, you can actually use your Bitcoin as collateral to secure a Canadian or US dollar loan. So if you're worried about selling at a bad time, well, this enables you to get cash without having to sell. And lastly, if you're a huge bull, you could check out their B2X uh, offering and that is where you can gain double the exposure to the price of Bitcoin. If you're interested in checking any of these out, there's a link down below and if you opt to get a loan, they'll actually credit you with an additional 50 bucks of Bitcoin. And secondly, Super happy to have these guys as part of the show now, Rise Wallet. Uh, I showed you some of these the other day. I did a tutorial, and basically, it's a gift card where you can buy and gift Bitcoin. So the way it works is you swing by a store, anything listed on their locations. You can pick it up. There's an activation fee, but the recipient of the card does not see that. So you can gift it. It locks in the dollar value until the time of the redemption. And basically, all you have to do is scratch off the back, scan it with the app, and it sends it to a... A Bitcoin wallet that is on your own phone that you own the private keys to. So it's a great onboarding platform for newbies to Bitcoin, in my opinion. Uh, so you can check out that. There's a link down below just to the website here. And you can also grab them at coincards.ca if you're trying to get some quick for the holidays and they're not available in your location yet. And with that, let's dive into the news. Uh, so, Mark Cuban, uh, dude who became a billionaire off of the last tech bubble, uh, he is spewing a little bit more criticism Bitcoin's way. Um, so he says that there is no chance for Bitcoin to become a reliable currency. So let's dive into the actual quote here. Uh, he's So um, when asked, uh, he said, there's no chance uh, of seeing a future scenario in which he sees Bitcoin becoming a reliable currency. Not because it can't work technically, although there are challenges, it could, but rather because it's too difficult to use too easy to hack, too, and way too easy to lose, too hard to understand, too hard to assess a value. Um, he said, it's too much work for people to know why Bitcoin over everything else in reference to rival crypto assets that are out there as well. Um, now, he says that uh, as far as value goes, he, he compared it to things like uh, collectibles like like gold or baseball cards. But he did say, at least I can look at my baseball card and go, ooh, that's my favorite player. That's Roberto Clem uh, Clemente. Um, he said he'd also rather have bananas than crypto due to the fruit's editability uh, or edit edibility. Um, so yeah, not super favorable for from him. Um, the funny thing is, so this is where it gets interesting. He uh, he owns the Dallas Mavericks, and the Dallas Mavericks accepts Bitcoin, which would denote some sort of utility in the actual asset in that he deemed it a, a decent idea to accept it. So he said, we first took Bitcoin about five years ago. No one bought anything, so we stopped. We decided to offer it again because the gateways became simpler. And if we have a customer that wants to buy with it, I'll take Bitcoin or bananas. So, <laughs> so let's jump back to what he said before. He said, it's way too difficult to use. Um, it's too easy to hack, too easy to lose, too hard to understand. But at the same time, he's saying that it became easier meaning that it's evolutionary. It's not static. It's not staying exactly the same. So just by that admission there, he's saying like, oh, well, it's gotten better, but it's never going to be good enough, um, <laughs> which is funny. So anyways, um, I just, I find it funny. I also find it interesting that somebody that that saw something in the tech startups of the 90s and made his millions and billions off of that and was able to kind of springboard himself to the title of billion, billionaire from that um, wouldn't understand that 
technology in its form now is not necessarily reminiscent of what it's going to look like in the future. Um, is Bitcoin difficult to use? I mean, it's gotten a hell of a lot easier, as he said. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's becoming easier and easier. And you see it being used more and more in places that really, really need it. So where is it going to be used first? Well, not places where you can just easily use the native banking system without any hitches. But in places where that stops functioning or is non-existent, then sure, people are going to dive into that. In places where the currency has failed, Venezuela, Argentina, um, even the Greek banking crisis, Cypriot banking crisis, um, places where it becomes difficult to use the legacy system and, and fiat currencies, well, that's where Bitcoin tends to shine. And so that's where you'll see it first. But as we see things deteriorate more with the legacy financial system, then I think Bitcoin will continue to shine. And we have secondary layers already being actively developed. Lightning Network has been live since March of 2018, and it has grown a lot and become even more and more usable every day. Um, it's now super cheap and instant to send Bitcoin. Is it Without flaws, absolutely not. But again, it's not static. It continues to evolve over time. Um, the other thing he talks about is is the alternative crypto assets and how it's too difficult for people to understand why Bitcoin over other ones. I would argue that they don't need to understand. Um, why do people hold US dollars over Venezuelan bolivars? Well, they naturally over time realize like, hey, this asset retains value and is harder to replicate. And thus, I'd rather park my monetary value in this as opposed to something else. And so it's almost like a subconscious flow of capital towards the hardest asset. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think it Sure, you can explain it to somebody if they want to sit down and take time, but even those that never get it explained to them or refuse to listen, it's my opinion that if Bitcoin continues to go the direction it's going, that that capital will slowly lean towards that. Um, but yeah, anyways, I'm going to use this as a segue into the next couple of stories here uh, where I said, well, where the legacy financial system falls apart and fails to function, that's where Bitcoin shines. Well, we've got uh, a couple instances of the war on cash being ramped up, I would say significantly. So in Greece, the Greeks are set to face heavy fines if they don't spend 30% of their income electronically. So that means if your reported income in a month is 1,000 euros, if you don't spend 300 euros of that via debit or credit card um, each month, well, then you're going to face fines um, based on what you don't spend. So it's a 22% tax on any remaining balance that you haven't spent electronically in the month. Uh, so if so, here's the example here. Let's say if an individual spends just 20% of their income through electronic means in a month, they would face a 22% tax on the remaining 10% bar some exclusions. So basically, if you were required to be spending 300 euros in a month of your of your income and you only spent 200, well that remaining 100 euros that you didn't spend electronically, they just tax 22% of it. So they just take 22 euros out of it. <laughs> like so this is what we're starting to deal with where where um, governments are starting to say like, hey, we're just gonna, we're gonna do away with cash. So we have absolute control over the currency. And you might think like, well, okay, what about taxation? Um, well, the thing is, Greeks of anyone should understand why they don't want to have all their money in the banks. It is a very cash based society. But I mean, with the Greek banking crisis, where all of a sudden people didn't have access to any more than 60 euros a day withdrawal, this was back in 2015, of course they're not going to want to keep their money electronically. They want it in hand because it can't be seized or, or uh, you know, they can't be put on a drip for them. They actually have it in hand. Um, and so I feel like this is... <sighs> It, they say it's to curb 
um, people skirting taxes. And maybe that's the case. Um, And a whole other conversation could be had over what taxes are just and what are not. But inherently, the Greeks, I would say, should not be trusting their banking system. And I think that this, in part, is a way to ensure that next time there's a crisis like that, there isn't a huge caste-based society and they can just clamp down and say, here's your haircut, we're taking this much of everybody's account. Um, Now, on the same front, we're looking to Italy and Italy is making uh, cash payments in 2020. Anything over 2,000 euros will be illegal. Illegal, anything over 2,000 euros. And one year later, anything over 1,000 euros will be illegal. So if you want to like, you know, walk into a store and buy a laptop, it's illegal for you to pay cash for it, which is <laughs> which is unbelievable. Like you couldn't buy like an iPhone with cash, you couldn't buy really anything. If you went on a big enough shopping trip buying some clothes, you it's illegal for you to pay with cash. Um, and if you, uh, <laughs> and all, not only that, but anyone who refuses to accept credit cards, they're instantly fined 30 euro, euros plus 4% of the amount that they refused to accept. So they are very much pushing to say, you're not allowed to use cash. That's the next step. They implement something like this. The the limits get less and less and less until people just naturally aren't using cash. And then all of a sudden cash is just gone. And then bank accounts start getting seized. You start to see haircuts because of bad monetary policy. Oh, we messed up. The only way to fund it is to take a little bit off the top of your your account or to just charge a general uh, negative interest rate. You've got savings accounts, great, negative 2% for you. Um, So it's this is where Bitcoin shines when there's no other option, when cash starts to disappear, when you're forced and pigeonholed into using the banking system that will then in, inevitably start to just steal money from the people. Well, there's Bitcoin for you. Um, and finally, I want to touch on one other story here, and this is to do with uh, the Bitcoin hash rate. So if you're unfamiliar, the hash rate is the total amount of computing power or the measure of the total amount of computing power on the Bitcoin network that is mining Bitcoin, solving uh, solving puzzles more or less um, in order to not only secure the network, but to uh, compete to get the next block of newly minted coins. Um, Now, this is a very volatile industry. Uh, You should think of it like this. No matter what, no matter how many people are mining, how much hash power comes onto the network, the same amount of Bitcoin are always going to be created at more or less the same issuance rate. So, to think of it another way, let's say there was a particular mountain that had a whole bunch of gold in it. Um, If there's one miner there, there's one individual guy with a pick and he starts picking away, he's probably going to be doing pretty well. If a second guy comes, well, okay, they can split the pot. But when that that mountain gets covered in people with like heavy um, industrial grade pieces of equipment that are digging deep. Well, all of a sudden that guy who, you know, just bought a brand new pick and went up the mountain and took all the time off work and allocated resources and funds to come there, he's not going to be nearly as profitable because the same amount of gold resides in that mountain. And now everybody is going to have to divvy it up based on how much and how hard they work to get it. And it's the same for Bitcoin. So, This can be a, it can kick your ass if you're in the Bitcoin mining industry and you don't account for potential fluctuations in the hash rate, namely to the upside. Uh, So what could be used to solve this? You don't want to be a miner and assume that you're going to be taking home a certain amount every 10 minutes or every day or every month. You have a a certain amount of expected income with the mining equipment that you have uh, and the overhead that you have to pay. A lot of the time that's a sunk cost when it comes to power, when it comes to your equipment itself. And so you want to be relatively sure that your income is going to be somewhat the same. And if all of a sudden another huge mining farm comes online and people start piling into the network and 
you are no longer a certain percentage of the network that gets cut in half, your rewards are going to be cut in half too. And so to hedge against this, a lot of miners are saying what we need is futures contracts that are tied to the hash rate so that you could essentially speculate in opposition of what you want to happen. So you're a miner, you want the hash rate to stay the same or go lower, but you know that might not be the case. So rather than completely risk a loss of that, you're going to place a bet that the hash rate will rise, and if it does, you get some money back. And somebody will obviously take the opposite side of that bet, but if it happens, you get some money back. Uh, and so it's more or less akin to purchasing insurance. So if things don't go your way and you're not as profitable as your projections had looked, then you get at least some of that money back. And that could be the difference of you staying in business or going bust. And so I think the proliferation of stuff like this and financial products around the industry will only further establish Bitcoin mining as a major industry because then you won't have a lot of those mining firms dropping out if they hedge properly and do their due diligence. Well, I, I think it's a great thing. But I'm curious to think what you guys think about this. Is this anything that you've thought of before? Do you worry about the complication of adding in these these uh, checks and balances? Is is this a little overwhelming for you to see? Did you did you ever think this through? Um, and let me know what you think about the the ban on cash or the the impending bans on cash, war on cash. We'll just say and Mark Cuban's thoughts on Bitcoin. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap it up, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Of course, as always, hit like, subscribe, and share. Always hit that share button. Great to have new people. You can help out the show in another way. If you want, check out the sponsors down below. There is Ledin and Rise Wallet. Those are both in the show notes. And also, while you're down there, check out Wasabi Wallet. It is a great way to help you with your privacy Cut those links between you and your coins so that any prying eyes don't get an eye into your, your finances. Um, and other than that, if you want, you can always send me a Bitcoin tip via the Lightning Network at my tippin.me page. And with that, I am out. Have a wonderful evening, and I will see you tomorrow for your daily session.